Tonight I want to begin a series of lessons entitled Jesus, the Great I Am. And what the series will do is cover the seven statements Jesus makes where he says, I am. And he defines himself as something that makes application to his mission as he lived on this old earth. And so when you think of the number, he made seven statements. And let's remember the number seven in Scripture is significant to completeness. And that's why I say that these seven statements define who Jesus is. It tells us the totality of his being. So tonight we'll begin with the statement Jesus makes twice. First of all, he makes a statement in John chapter 8 and in verse 12. And then also in John chapter 9 in verse 5. This statement was made after the woman with the infirmity of the blood, or excuse me, the lady who was caught in the very act of adultery. You remember they gathered this lady and brought her before Jesus and said, what are you going to do? The law says she is to be put to death. And remember Jesus doodling on the ground. He makes a very profound statement. You who are without sin, cast the first stone. And one by one, after they heard that, they were convicted by their conscience, it says, and they went out, the oldest to the youngest. And eventually it was just Jesus and the woman. And he raised up, and he saw that no one was there. And he asked Asher, he said, woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no, no one's condemned me, Lord. And Jesus says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And then you go over to John chapter 9 and look at verse 5, where he says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. You know, I go back to that passage in John 8, and I begin to think to myself, what does Jesus say, saying those words, I am the light, but what does that have to do with the woman caught in adultery? What did Jesus do? What did he say to those accusers of the woman? Jesus was saying, let me reveal to you the truth of God's word, of God's word. In other words, these men thought they had him in a corner, but when he told them what the law said, it was the light of truth being turned on. And that's why he could say that he was the light of the world. And when you think about this word light, the word light occurs in Scripture 253 times. Out of the 253, 94 of them appear in the New Testament. But if you narrow that number down, 53, or 52 of them are found in the Gospel records. Brother, do you think this word light, the concept of light, is important to Jesus and what his mission is? Absolutely. You turn back to a passage I know most of us are familiar with, at least verse 16 anyway, right? We all know verse 16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you know what verse 17 down through verse 21 says? 
For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. Jesus, the accusers came. They loved to be in the darkness, but Jesus shed light, and they went away. So within the statement of Jesus, I am the light of the world, let's share three thoughts tonight. Number one, think about the character of this light. When you think about Jesus as the light of the world, that light is bright and obvious. When I think about Jesus being that light that is bright and obvious, I turn over to Hebrews chapter 1. And as I look at Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself heard their sin, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. His majesty was seen in the revelation of light. Now, I'm not going to read, if you picked up one of the, the outline PowerPoints out front, I'm not going to read all these passages. But how many of you remember the lesson from this morning? Do, do you remember the lesson from this morning the, about the transfiguration? When Peter, James, and John went up, the true character of Jesus was shown in the glory of the brightness of his appearance. Think secondly under this point about the works which Jesus did. Whose work did Jesus come into the world to do? Jesus himself says that he came into the world to do the works of the Father who sent him. Turn over to John chapter 10. Look at verse 36 down through verse 38. Do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. When Jesus came, Jesus did not want credit for what he was doing. He wanted them to see the glory of the Father through what he did. But a third characteristic of this light is we need to understand that the light of Jesus is unlimited. If, and the biggest word in the English language, right? The light of Jesus is unlimited if we let it have free course in our life. Turn over to the book of Romans, chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, notice the last verses of that chapter, beginning in verse 35. Paul first asks a question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
And then he asked a further question. He said, well, will it be tribulation? Will it be distress? Will it be persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, all what things? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. In all of those things, the scripture says we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. In other words, the characteristic of the light, that the light of Jesus is unlimited, is when we realize that no matter what we go through in life, we are more than conquerors. We can overcome any obstacle that's placed before us because of the light of Jesus. In the light of Jesus, is shown through the love that he exhibited towards us. Point number two tonight, notice the action of light. When those accusers came, Jesus used scripture to show what was right and what was wrong. I have a whole bunch of verses there. And the one I want to look at is not even listed. Go back to Matthew chapter 4 and begin looking in verse 1. And I'm not going to read all these verses to you, by the way. But in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, it is there that we have recorded for us the temptations of Jesus. And you'll remember as Satan tempted Jesus, he twisted the words of God to fit the narrative that he wanted it to be. In verse number three, if you are the Son of God, Command that these stones become bread. Satan obviously knew that Jesus had the power to turn stones into bread, did he not? But how did Jesus respond? When Jesus quoted, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus said, Satan, you're over here in darkness. Let me show you the light. Jesus kept the scripture in proper context. Jesus used the word to expose the error of Satan. What was right and what was wrong. All right, let's go a little bit further. Verse 6. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give His angels charge concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus, throw yourself down. If you get hurt, if you harm yourself, if you stub your toe, the angels will be there to take care of you. Out of Jesus. Again, it is written, Thou shalt not what? Tempt the Lord your God. Satan was using the scripture in a manner that would have been physical harm. Jesus says, It's wrong to tempt him. It's wrong to tempt me. Let me ask you a question. Did the angels minister to Jesus at any time in his life? 
They did, didn't they? They did when he was suffering through the trial, the cross. They were there. But they didn't have to be tempted to do it. They did it to fulfill a mission. And then the last one, when he takes him up into the high mountain, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. You fall down and worship me and I'll give you everything that is within your sight. Jesus exposes his error. Away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Satan says, I'll give you this if you'll just fall down and worship me. Satan didn't understand that all things already belong to Jesus. He was there in creation, was he not? At the very beginning of time, was Jesus there when the world we live in was spoke into existence? Jesus being part of the Godhead owns everything in the world. But Satan was trying to cause Jesus to sin. We have three recorded. Each time Satan takes scripture, makes it wrong, Jesus correctly interprets the scripture to show Satan what is right. The light, the word, exposes the error. What does Jesus give us? Does he not give us sight? Does he not give us the ability to see what is right versus what is wrong? Has the ability of man to choose between right and wrong, is that a relatively new concept or is that a concept as old as time? Go back to the garden. Yep, I'm going back there. Go back to the garden. Let's start with the serpent. Did the serpent have a choice to do what was right? Did the serpent have a choice to do what was right? He said, well, brother, what do you mean did the serpent have the ability to choose? Did the serpent have the ability not to tempt Eve? The answer is yes. Did Eve have the ability to turn down the temptation of the serpent? Yep. Did Adam have the ability to turn down the temptation from Eve? How was it that Adam and Eve and even the serpent knew what was right? Because the word of the Lord told them. When God gave the command to Adam and Eve of everything in the garden, you can indulge all you want. But, and I'm paraphrasing it, right? But there is a tree that's in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and of evil. You shall never eat that fruit. Would have been better if they had never looked at that fruit. He said, the day that you eat of that fruit, you shall surely die. Did God keep his promise? Did God keep his promise that the day they ate of the fruit, that they would surely die? God didn't say it was going to be an instantaneous death. The death that was spoken of is that separation 
from God. It is that physical death that we suffer. The light exposes the air. The light, the word, exposes us to what is right and what is wrong and it leaves us the choice to choose between the two. Point number three tonight. The extension of this light. How far does the light shine? How far does the light shine? I believe Jesus extends his light to the whole world. The light of the word is available for all. We sing a song occasionally, the gospel is for all. Of one the Lord has made the race, the gospel is for all. The light is for all. I'm going to have to ask Phoenix if he can remember. Do you remember the song you sang Wednesday night? Think hard. What goes all around the neighborhood? doing this. We sang this little Christian light of the night. And that last verse, when I was a kid, we tried to do that circle as big as we could, Charlie. Because we want that light to go into all the world. I want you tonight to think about efforts that we at South Jackson make to extend the light of Jesus into all the world. In our community, we mail house to house, heart to heart. House to house, heart to heart is meant to be an introduction. It's not meant to do the work that we need to do. We sponsor the television program, The Gospel of Christ. Just last week, three of my friends said, you're famous because they saw my ugly mug in a television commercial. I haven't talked to Joey recently, but he tells me viewership is very good. And when you see viewership steadily climbing, that's interested people which eventually will result in a desire to know more about the truth. Well, how do we go into all the world? Well, did you realize we do it two ways? We have Brother Sam on the ground in Southeast Asia, working hard every day to spread the gospel. But we do it right here through that little thing in the back called the camera. When we send out our live stream. And I've been amazed here lately. Our Wednesday night Bible studies. Normally when I leave the building there's six views. Brother Kenny I checked this morning we had 38. 38. Those are folks from all over. Someone says, well, we don't know how much good that does. It's not my responsibility to know how much good it does. My job is to extend the light of the world into all the world. Our job is to do that. You see, Jesus wants us what? To follow his example. Now, I could be wrong. Billy, you, you can help me out. You were wrong because you mowed. When, when you turn off of Highway 18 and you turn on to go play, 
and you get ready to turn into our parking lot. There used to be two of these, one on each side of the driveway. They're red. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Are the reflectors still out there or are they gone? They gone. They, they gone. gone. Okay. All right, they're gone. But those reflectors were there for a reason. The first one is to say, okay, you're getting close to where you need to turn in. And the second one says, Doug, if you get past this one, you done gone too far. You and I are to be reflectors of Jesus between those two points. Not to go less than and not to, uh, let me rephrase this, not to take away nor add to. We are to stay true to the word and the example that Jesus set for us. Aren't we told in the Sermon on the Mount that we are what? The light of the world. Brethren, we live in a world as we've heard in class, in sermons, in prayers. Do we live in a world of darkness? Do we live in a world of darkness? What can you do to make it a little less dark? You can be the reflector of Jesus. So I ask you, what will you do tonight? What are you going to do with the light of Christ? Will you see the character that he exhibits? Will you allow the action to change your life? And after you allow it to change your life, will you be willing to be the light in a dark, desperate world? That's your choice. Tonight, if you're here and not a member of the body of Christ, we're prepared to baptize you into Christ so that you can begin to be the light that you need to be. Or if you've done that and you've walked away, you can come home tonight. Whatever need you might have, we pray you come while we stand and while we sing.